I think the the misconception of time is largely what yeah. causes people to behave in ways that, that self sabotage. Variance is a very very difficult thing for the mind to understand. In fact, I would argue that the mind can't understand variance. It's not built to understand variance in the same way that the ego is not built to understand loss or change. It just it's it's not what its job yeah. is. So if you yeah. see how useless that regrettable, that regret function of the mind is, you can drop that and say, okay, well, I'm still here and I, and there's still time. So how do I want to best use this time to maximize the benefit of my journey? That's a functional relationship with time. So, uh, second question is basically about uh, variance and volume. Uh, I think, uh, and, and this is like a big question. We sort of know answers to, but it keeps coming back in experience that you may not actually know it inherently uh, by the situations that come up and by different kinds of ways in which it manifests. Uh, one of the biggest things being like the like so in that I have sort of have broad points I'll just point out them so that we can just uh, go through them like uh, one aspect of it is uh, about mixing up real life money and game points mm. the the sub the sub aspect of it is like getting into a winner's trap or a loser's trap like you're winning in a session you want to book a profit or like you know if you're losing you're trying to chase those losses um, so there is that fear and then there is that fear of loss there's an anxiety related to that fear of loss and when that loss happens, there is a relatability to self-worth and like you putting yourself down because of that loss. And then hence eventually losing motivation and sort of losing vision over the whole picture. So so there is the one aspect of variance that's coming and hitting you. And then there is a second aspect of how it changes our internal state in the moment as well as like over the macro, which eventually again comes down to attract more variance. Sure. For me, the easiest way to attack all of these questions with one angle of inquiry is to frame them all into our understanding of time. I think the, the misconception of time is largely what causes people to behave in ways that self-sabotage. Variance is a very, very difficult thing for the mind to understand. In fact, I would argue that the mind can't understand variance. It's not built to understand variance in the same way that the ego is not built to understand loss or change. It just, it's, it's not what its job is. Um, so it begs the question of what is this part of our awareness that we can cultivate that is able to, to, to have a more functional relationship with variance and, and time. This is why I think poker is just a beautiful uh, breeding ground for introspection and uh, and why I think you find a lot of guys who are into uh, spirituality through poker is because it really forces you to the edge of the ego in terms of how to understand and, and deal with variance and develop a, a functional working relationship with it. Um, I know you feel strongly on this on this point so why don't you say what what you think can help and i'll try to organize my thoughts in the meantime while i listen because it's it's clearly a long topic yeah. and one of my favorites <laughs> i mean so I, yeah i mean I, I think like i want to just probably read out the poem that i wrote <laughs> here because uh, that kind of uh, sort of encapsulates the whole thing uh, cards they hide the equities and the odds odds of life made or ruined, made an illusion of the times yet to come, the turn the river changes everything, made into ruined and ruined into more. Knowing the odds decisions are made of logic and intuition begins the dance of variance. Mixing up the logic with magic, out it throws a card from its madness, why you mad bro? Madness it is of the hopeful and the hopeless and the swings from one to another. In this madness, the mind dissects, ranges and faces to come up with logic that's to guide. 
laced with poison of self-preservation and insecure motives. Logic is compromised to the veil of illusion. Layers and layers of illusion of self and life to make a decision. Decision which yields an outcome thrown from the variance. Is it mad to look at the mad dance of variance to decipher the decision? Or to look at the decision to decipher the thought? Or to look at the thought to decipher the logic? Or to look at the logic to decipher it? Or to look at the intent to decipher the objective when the objective of it all is to keep you in the game of illusion? To rise above, be utterly untouched by this madness, needs work not of the mind, the experience of beyond, a sustenance of the void. How will the ever, how will the game ever give this to you? The game of illusions, the game of ego, the game of life, poker. Nice, bro. What I love, <laughs> what I love about it is, it moves through a progression of change understanding change all the way to what is the ultimate objective of this well i would say and i think what the poem is trying to say from my interpretation is that the ultimate the ultimate goal would be to break out of the illusion of variance altogether the illusion of to break out of the illusion that we have some control over variance in the short term and also to break out of the illusion that we don't have control over in the long term because we do have control over it in the long term. We actually do. Not full control, but the longer you play, yeah. let's talk about now like a three year sample, a one million hand sample. I can mix it up to speak to cash game and, and tournament guys. There is an amount of volume or sample size that you can accrue as a player that will no longer put your career in jeopardy. It might be the difference between making a thousand buy-ins or 1100 buy-ins, but it's no longer the difference between you winning and losing. That's what happens when you play a long period of time. That's what happens when you play a lot of hands. Um, so I think it's the yeah. it's the biggest thing that we're trying to. It is like, it sort of distorts your perception of time in so much. Um, just a two or three days of, or, or even a week of losing can like feel like such a big thing. Uh, and and then it also kind of questions your uh, ability to continue in the game, which sort of you know puts the whole big jeopardy. And uh, that's that's where like you 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 rightly pointed out that time, the whole concept of time is the underlying essence of this thing. That because if because for you to kind of you've been in this industry for a long time, right? Like, but not a lot of people are like and when they are kind of venturing and kind of trying to figure out committed to this game for you to see success in it. But people are trying to figure out whether it or not make it and every time the variance sort of come back when they kind of project that upon their self work, then it becomes even more difficult right? like because no one wants to feel shit like and Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I think that the there are things you can do to give yourself a better chance at having a healthy relationship with the time it takes for variance to press out. Separating poker fun funds from life funds is a big one. It's one of the biggest things we actually are um, strict on in our company is like, we make sure that players have a few months living expenses before they join contract. Because if you don't, you're asking for trouble. How are you supposed to be able to endure variance if you need the money to pay this month's rent? There's logistical things that need to be taken care of before you can actually have a healthy, mature relationship to a career like this because there is volatility involved. Um, it's the same reason that I don't encourage men with families and full-time jobs to give the job up completely if they're thinking about becoming pro. Pick a more incremental response than that play a little bit more until you have more proof that you're a winner and then slowly leave the leave the real world job don't just jump over to something without without a security net when there's volatility inherent in in the thing you're jumping into that's reckless um but yeah that, the, the the one thing that came to my mind while you're 
speaking about that was that we can get so caught up in the short term. And for me, it's very interesting, not just having been in the career for 15 years now, but running a company of players who I stake, these guys play a million hands a month combined on the cash game side of things. And what I see on the ground level when I'm doing consults and and working with them individually is a lot of different individual stories of what the variance means to me and how it's how it's affecting me and all of my assumptions on how it's going to play out. This is the player's viewpoint. And then at the end of the month, I see the team report and it always is in line with the all in EV. It always is in line with the average EV BB per hundred that we've been expecting for the team. So what that tells me is none of those stories really matter. Those stories are interesting to the ego that's enduring them and, and through all of the delusion that it, that it grabs onto so that it can make sense of what's happening. But in the big picture, we play a million hands a month and it turns out, turns out just fine every time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. And, and, and that's, a, that's a thing we spoke earlier too, right? Like where um, if you end up putting that volume, you get that result. But because your perception is so much, uh, like your motivation to continue so much down because of the variance that you end up not putting that volume which gives you that result and evens out that variance so like when you are that individual player you are not getting that perspective of the team because your volume doesn't correlate to the middle in sample hand because your volume is both variance driven as well as you know volume is down one of the things i've been speaking a lot about in the last couple of months is developing this relationship with your future self. I like to use the million hand yourself, 1 million hands in the future or for MTT guys, yourself three years into the future, a period of time where you are not susceptible to the volatilities of variance. It's sort of a weird way to put it, but you get what I mean. Yeah. A period of time where variance will press out certainly. And I think if you begin to cultivate that relationship with your future self, what you start to see is it makes it easier to play through the the day-to-day struggle of the downswing because as long as you have a certainty that things are going to work out, as long as you can continue to play, then it's easier to continue to play. It's about having certainty that this isn't going to result in the sky falling on me. And in order to to have that type of certainty, you do need to have a sufficient bankroll. So it's back to the logistics. In order to feel safe about the three-year vision, we have to make sure that our bankroll management plan isn't putting us under such a tremendous amount of volatility that there's a 30% chance we could go broke. If we can minimize that risk of ruin to a single digit number, low single digit, 3%, 2%, 1%, well, now that's something we can put an adequate amount of faith into and actually leverage our efforts towards a goal that we feel confident in. I think it's important. Yeah. You can't you can't ignore that side of it. The funny thing is like all the not to do things you've spoken about are the things that I've personally done and I've gone through all those motions. And then um, one point still is that uh, and it, it's definitely a more difficult, like what you talked about, not having savings to back up for your grind and all of that things I've gone through. And the one of the one of the good takeaways for me is, in spite of all of that, still like you can get a sane uh, perspective on it. On it. And uh, if if at all anything, like if you are in a in a sort of way, it is like a very high risk mode of doing it, but still. Uh, maybe it teaches you faster or the other way around too but uh, it's just that even if you go through all of that stuff like and i've gone through all of that stuff and it's still it's it's just a question of just uh, committing to that path and there have been multiple times where that has been at question because of the financial pressures and everything like you know about it and uh, but somehow somehow just uh, life kept me on it you know that's a, that's the only explanation i sort of can give it and it can be frustrating if you've made a lot of mistakes logistically in the past. Log- by logistically, I may I mainly mean like bankroll management being probably the main one. Um, 
that can be frustrating to look back on and say, well, if I would have just had better bankroll management in the past, my journey would be further along because I wouldn't have had to go back and rebuild so many times. That's a nice thought, but it's not very helpful. It's interesting. It's one of those things that's interesting, but not helpful because we can't change the past. So if you see how useless that regrettable, that regret function of the mind is, you can drop that and say, okay, well, I'm still here and I, and there's still time. So how do I want to best use this time to maximize the benefit of my journey? That's a functional relationship with time. That's, that's being in right relationship to life by being present yeah. enough to look forward instead of backward. It's, it's funny to put it that way, but first we need to be present enough to get out of the past and then we can start to map towards the future. And that all takes place here and now we'll create the plan here and now based on the resources we have available. Um, but I think a lot of guys have a, a hard time sacking back up and, and, and getting back on a path that is clearly logical, but makes them feel like sometimes it's, it's more of a reminder that they were doing it wrong in the past. The mind hates that the mind hates to be proven wrong. And so what you see a lot of is guys who, who fall down, but don't get back up because it's more painful to admit how wrong they did it than it is. I, I think like one of the, one of the biggest uh, deltas was that point that, you know, you accept that you fucked up and you accept what is there because uh, that is really the difficult part, right? Because it, it, uh, it kinds of, then you have to be able to distinguish that between you, your actions and your self worth. Because if that goes in that direction, then it becomes even more painful because then you're kind of crippled. You will not be able to even put in the energy to work through it. And, so, and this, this gets into your self-worth yeah. question too. And, and the motivation, the vision, the self-worth, this contains all of that. So it's a, it's a nice entry point yeah. into it where if you think about what's going on in a person who is having trouble getting back on a productive path because of mistakes they made in the past that is a self-worth issue that's an issue of how they're framing their reality currently based on what they decided they did wrong in the past and when i say that's a self-worth issue i mean that has to do with how you're seeing yourself and speaking to yourself in the inner narrative of your mind so just take a take a look at these two types of minds and i think it's going to be really clear why why one is a better alternative than the other both of these guys made huge mistakes they blew a they blew a six-figure role when they were a 25 year old kid and they spent the last two years trying to basically figure out what happened and now they're 28 and they have ten thousand dollars that they're thinking about taking a shot with but they're scared they're scared because they don't want to go back down that same path of self-destruction now person type one is the type of guy who says, you know what? I can't go back and do this again. I got to keep doing my my low risk nine to five job, which now that coronavirus is here, everybody's sort of seeing that that's not <laughs> even really the security you thought it contained. It just seemed that way until the world gets shaken up. The type of guy that is convinced that he can't go back and take risks again because of the pain he endured from being risky in the past. And the way he dealt with that was to criticize himself and say, this is why you shouldn't take risks. This is why you shouldn't do anything outside of normal or average is because when you fall, there's no one there to pick you up and everybody's laughing, telling you, you shouldn't have tried it. You shouldn't have done this poker thing. Everybody said it was ridiculous. And now look, you're the joke of the family or you're the joke of all your friends. That's person type one. That guy's paralyzed for now, at least. Person type two says, oh, okay, I, I, I tried the poker thing when I was 25 and you know what, I made a bunch of mistakes and, and now that I've had time to reflect on those mistakes, I see clearly where I could have made adjustments to my overall strategy, you know, in game and in bankroll management, in the micro and the macro. I'm seeing all these avenues for a different way to go about this and I also see that what is going to allow me to even get started again is whether or not I can take a supportive relationship to myself in the present. 
if I keep playing this game of woe is me, I should be ashamed of myself. That's a very, very surefire way to never gain the momentum I need to take a next step forward. That is a surefire way to keep myself in a scared position, almost like I'm fighting against some parent in my mind who's yelling at me. You've become your own prison guard, basically, if you do it that way. This guy, however, has a functional relationship with mistakes and he says, I'm not gonna be my own prison guard. I'm just gonna learn from this, knowing that it's put me exactly where I need to be to make the next most beneficial adjustment. And I'm gonna do that in a supportive way and move forward from there. Those are two very different types of players. Those are two very different types of thinkers. Yeah, and, and, and also even if you are the uh, type one guy, uh, which I've been at some point in time, and then there are so many resources out there, like the conversation that you had with Eliot, uh, like I mentioned to earlier, that was something which I could see that, you know, even this conversation that we're having, if someone is able to listen to this and they're able you know people have gone through this stuff and they have come out of it and these are not something that's only happening to you and the biggest feeling is you feel like you are helpless you are alone in this and when you have a certain other person going through it and like and this is something which i've seen which is common across all the top players is they have gone through these rigors like maybe some more than the other but um, they have gone through this this path and then is it's just that you find that momentum in these small conversations or just knowing that you know this is the way to do it or someone has gone that itself gives you so much motivation and uh, while you are on a certain high within yourself where you're doing really good it's also it also helps to kind of give that vibe off to everyone around because um, you know when you need that uh, support and which happened to me personally to when i needed that there were a lot of people there to uh, just give that small momentum push, you know, or just to take a step by step. Like first is fucking accept where you are. Like if you're broke, you're broke. Like, and then, yeah. You know what you need to do. And I think it's the so biggest resistance was the biggest part to overcome. The biggest problem I think in the industry right now is that there's there's too strong of a narrative that you should just deal with the variance and grow up. You know, be a big yeah. boy and get through this. That causes us to create that that inner opposition where we have this prison guard version of ourselves yelling at this version of ourselves that really is wounded by variance and really does feel alone and doesn't know how to really process it and get on the right path. And I think it's the thing that is the most valuable to the industry. And it's the reason that I wanted to do this stuff with you is to be able to provide a supportive platform to more players who are interested in making healthy adjustments to the way that they approach this yeah. career and the, the, and the way that they approach problem solving in general. And a huge part of that is having an outside support system because that's the first step to developing a more supportive inner narrative. If no one's helping you on the outside to feel good about yourself and to feel like it's okay to make mistakes, how are you supposed to learn how to talk to yourself? The way that you speak to yourself is a product of the way that authority figures from the past and, and support systems from the past have trained you to take feedback. So I think it's a huge thing and it's where all my attention is basically right now in terms of shifting my my roles as a as a coach in the company towards player support making sure the players have what they need um and i wanted to extend that to india because i just think it's an unexplored territory for me where all you guys speak english and we have a chance to have this level of communication that we can that we can benefit from i can't do that in china um so there's so there's so much opportunity with how how great the population of india actually is to have an impact, I think, on, on people that are really ready to make this upgrade. So I think that's a good place to stop for today and to turn it over. I, I assume we're going to share this with, with the guys. So I'd like to turn it over to you guys and say if there if there are any topics about this discussion today that, that resonated with you or you feel like you have a follow-up question to, that would be a great place to start for the next one. Um, the last thing I'll say is if, if you would like to do a one-on-one -on -one consult, reach out to Anuj for my calendar booking link and he'll get that over to you. We've been doing a few already. I, I did two already earlier today and uh, I got a couple of guys that were really introspective dudes and, and it was great combo and 
maybe we can see if they're willing to share those to Anoush and I can get those links over to you. We could we can share them. Sure. All right. All right, brother. I'll talk soon, okay? Yeah. See you. See you. See ya.